Hello everyone, welcome back to Mind Pump. In this episode, we talk about the importance of training full ranges of motion for functional flexibility. Later, we talk about the benefits of cold therapy during the cold and flu season and a lot more. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as, I wanna get back into sports, but I don't wanna hurt myself. I have a demanding job and I think I might be training too hard. How do I know? Finally, I've been training for a long time. I want to stay mobile and pain-free, but I do not want to give up lifting heavy. What should I do? One more thing before we get going here. It's been almost three years since we've done a live event, and we're having one right here at the Mind Pump Studio on December 2nd. You can come join us. Go check the event out at mindpumplive.com and register. Seats are going quickly. All right, here comes the show. The best form of exercise for real flexibility strength training oh that's not true oh yes it is <laughs> you know what this is going to be controversial but let me let me explain I thought it was the bar method let me explain what i mean here first when i said real flexibility what i mean is functional flexibility so this is the kind of flexibility that's actually usable in the real world so what does that mean that means you have a range of motion that you're also strong and stable and not just a range of motion so to give you an example of like something or someone that would be really flexible but not really uh Functionally fle functional flexibility would be like a two-year-old or a one-year-old, right? You can like, they, they're super limber and flexible, but they don't have very much strength and stability. So putting them in those ranges of motion, it's they're not stable. And in fact, they get injured <laughs> under load. I don't suggest you do that with a one-year-old, but you get my point here. Um, that's true for adults, right? So you can have lots of flexibility. In fact, flexibility without strength is, is massive instability and a huge injury risk. So why is strength training the best? Well, with strength training, if you do it right and you get a full range of motion, like a really good full range of motion, and you and you work on improving your range of motion, you work on control and stability, you get more flexible and you have strength in that range of motion, so it becomes functional. Well, I think that's what people don't consider is that uh, when you train, that's why it's important to go full range of motion and be able to have access to, um, you know, the that different range. Otherwise it's you get into that position where what we train the most is where our strength is. And so now like <clears throat> you're going to have those moments where you're going to be tight, you're going to be restricted. Your body starts to kind of uh, protect itself from unfamiliar areas. So it's um, you know, if you do it right and, and you yes. go through that full range, I agree. Yeah. How would you explain to somebody who, who, who would argue to you guys and say <clears throat> that uh, I totally disagree. I know how I feel when I lift weights all the time. Yeah, that's a good question. I feel super stiff and tight. There's nothing you can do to convince me that I have better range of motion in that situation than the other. How would you communicate? So there's, I, I there's, want to see how you work out. Yeah, there's two. Well, yes. Yeah, so, so there's two parts to this. One is when your muscles are sore, they're going to be more tight. So if you train often, you're going to feel tighter. That's normal. But here's a second. This is a big one. If you don't constantly work on, and there's an appropriate way to do this, by the way. I want to be clear. You don't just push yourself through new ranges of motion because you'll hurt yourself. You have to go very light. You have to under, understand stability. You have to know how to work on mobility in order to work into these new ranges of motion. But if you don't do that and you just train, like you just squat to parallel, you just do overhead presses to a certain point and you train within just particular ranges of motion, you get really strong, like Justin said, in those ranges of motion. And then you're, you're even weaker in comparison outside of those ranges of motion. In other words, the ratio of strength to weakness now becomes larger when you go from where you train to outside of the way you train. So then your body keeps you yeah. in that range of motion even more. The potential for injury goes up. That's right. That's and that's why you see like people lift a lot of weights and they do it in a particular way. They look tight. Mm -hmm. They move like they're tight. Now, if you do it right and you challenge mm -hmm. ranges of motion, you work in all different planes, you work on stability and mobility, you'll continue to build strength in newer, longer ranges of motion. You'll actually improve your flexibility. And it's the real kind of flexibility that has... Uh, real applicable uh, applications in the real world and reduces the risk of injury the greatest. All right, today's contest, you can win free access to Map Strong. Here's how you enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section. You'll get free access to Maps Strong. Now, we also have a sale going on right now, all month long. Maps OCR, 50% off and MAPS Cardio, 50% off. Both half off only for the month of November. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. This is a off question, but um, I had my aunt call me last night and I had she has COVID 
and I, I we haven't talked about this in so long because I think every, all of us are so over it. Um, but I know you're normally up and up on like the latest greatest stuff. So are are we in, are we are we spiking in that right now? And is there what what are you seeing with with COVID cases and, and stuff right now? Are we yeah? Are we, it's it's and like death rate and all that stuff. Like I haven't I haven't paid attention to that in so long now. <laughs> death rate's really low. Yeah. Um, because the you know the the strains of COVID now are not as deadly, and a lot of people have a certain level of immunity, either from prior infection, vaccine, or both. Um, so death rate's going down. Um, it's actually, I think it's lower. If I'm not mistaken, it's lower than the flu. Um, and, but it is spiking because it's the, it's the season. Yeah. So isn't there, cold. there's also flu and other colds yeah. f- like flowing around right now at the same time. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just kind of in the mix now with all these other, um, sicknesses that we have to deal with in this, uh, winter season. Yeah. yeah COVID is, it's, uh, it's going it's just an endemic yearly thing that people are going to, you know, sometimes get like every year people, you know, get a cold, not, not the flu. I haven't gotten the flu in years, but cold, you know, I'll probably get one a year or something like that. Yeah. So it's going to be like that. Um, but, but, the, but it's becoming more mild for sure. And you can see that the way they talk about it now is the fear. Now, do you guys have anybody personally who's got it more than twice? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, you have people that have caught oh, yeah, more yeah. than twice. Uh-huh. You too? Uh, yeah, but no, yeah. I think you're both lying. What are you? Who, no, the, I have, you know? but they're, yeah, there's, I mean, it, they were all vaccinated, <laughs> which you is know irony. You, you know how you want I didn't to deliver, know how to it's, deliver that one. Uh, uh, like, well, uh, is it okay uh, to say that now? <laughs> yeah. Like you, that so, you, so you guys really know people that have? I do for a fact. For a fact. For a fact. Yeah, I have uh, some friends and family members that have had it two times. One one person I know has had it three times. Um, That's what I was asking. Three. I know I had it twice. Oh, oh, so oh, oh, oh. I, What I r- recall was uh, um, we. You uh, could not Matthews have it three, it three times. times. I think Mike Matthews had it three times. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. No, he had. You know, and I don't take that as. I remember Mike didn't even test on like one or two times. So you, I want three positive tests to confirm that. I have yet yeah. to meet anybody who has tested three times positively. I've heard lots of people go like, "Oh yeah, I definitely had it." And then like back in March, and then I, I tested positive last month and then I got it again. It's like, "No, no, no." Like I haven't heard of somebody literally testing three times positive. I've heard two times is the most I know I've heard. one person mm. who tested three times. Um I can't say their name or anything, but I know one person and and it was really mild. The first time was like everybody else fever, the whole deal. Yeah. And then it was mild, mild tested. And it showed up, uh, but I know a lot of people who had it twice. I think it's going to be like every other coronavirus. You're just going to, yeah. you're probably going to get it every couple or few years. Mm-hmm. And, and I imagine gonna, each time it should be less and less severe, right? Like the cold, you, you know, think. think about the last 10 colds you had out of those. Okay. Probably one of them was like, oh, this is a terrible cold. And the rest of them were kind of like, you know, a little sniffly. Well, that's normally because it's a, a new strain, right? When you hit, when it hits you pretty hard like that, of it, something. It's a variation, right? So, like yeah. you have or environmental stresses, or like I mean, I yeah. wonder how like you know worn down your body yeah. is the time that you receive it. Yeah. So yeah. that yeah. kind of stuff. My gra- so you want to trip off this? My grandmother. So my grandfather just passed away. It's very hard on my grandmother. She's eighty six, and she does not have super great health. She's on medications and all that stuff. She caught COVID because during the time when my grandfather died, lots of people are visiting. She hadn't got COVID ever. Okay. She caught COVID. All of us freaked out because she's definitely in the category of people yeah, who are yeah. not supposed to survive. Uh, okay. Yeah. This, you want to know how, what happened to my grandma? 86 uh, years old. Uh. She kind of had a little sore throat. They tested her. Oh my God, you have COVID. She's like, I'm tired. I'm gonna go to bed. Woke up the next day. No symptoms. She was negative two days later. Wow. I don't wow. understand. Two days later. Wow. And I wow. thought maybe be, she must have been exposed to another type of coronavirus. <clears throat> before and had some kind of immunity because otherwise like she's not like yeah, just bounce she's, right she back. should she's supposed to be the person that that goes bad for it's really weird do you yeah. know uh i don't know if you guys know, i've been back uh doing the cold plunge consistently again i didn't do it today but i had been consistently doing it um throughout the week like last week i think i did it three times week before that i think i did it five times like so i'm back to like like really consistently doing that uh, and perfect timing because I'm starting to see a bunch of my family getting sick. That's what kind of promoted this conversation is I've had, I had just had my aunt call me, said she had COVID. Max was sick not just a few days ago. I had my, my uh, mother-in-law. Like we've had a lot of people sick in the family. I swear to God, when I am on, when I am consistent with that. There is definitely something to that. I can, I can, I can personally feel. Now, I'm sure that I notice such a big difference because I'm somebody who is has such a weak immune system that I, I get, I normally catch everything. If so, I'm like, I'm the type of guy who, if someone is sick in the vicinity of me, it's like, oh, great. 
I'm already planning for how I'm going to be sick the next day because I catch everything except for the, the the stent that I went through in my life, which was about a year there when we first started re- doing the podcast where we were doing the cryotherapy and the cold plunging and so that. That was the healthiest for the longest period of time I'd ever felt in my life. And I swear to God, I'm back at it again. And I feel like already I've been around it and I not caught nothing. I just found, I mean, literally while you're talking, uh, several studies, um, you know, one showing that cold water immersions and sauna both elevate the immune system or strengthen it. I found another study showing that cold temperatures can stop autoimmune diseases from attacking the body. It's almost like um, those stresses are immune regulators strengthening what needs to get strengthened and, and bringing down what may be overactive. So that yeah. may be what you're noticing. God, just It's <laughs> wild to me. It's very, very noticeable. So right now I could go in there because I brought <clears throat> stuff today, but yeah. I haven't used it. I could just jump in and jump yeah. out. Filters running on it. We, Jerry bought towels, like three towels for all of us. There's a thing for you to hang your stuff and dry inside the locker in there. Like it's all, it's set. I'll use it today. So, it's time. And I start it. So I'll tell you, I started at two minutes. And and right out the gates, yeah. That's not very long, for really. The, yeah, it's not very long for that. And we're not at the super low, so we're at forty degrees. Justin, is that what? Yeah, we're, 40, yeah, forty degrees. degrees. I think is where he started us at. Is that how cold or was 50 it? Fifty degrees. I think it was forty. How yeah, cold was at that time? We put ice in it in comparison. Remember, we put ice. Ooh, in Ooh, that's. I think that, it's colder. That okay, would be yeah. colder. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is bearable. And I, I actually, it only took me that first week of doing it every day to get to re, like pretty comfortable at two minutes, and now I'm doing four. So I'm already doing four minutes uh, in there. I'll and, try it today. Yeah, yeah. I it just, happens. I don't know. I, it, it's, it's been, um, life changing for someone like me who, who always gets sick. It, it definitely, uh, maybe I got lucky with one encounter, but not three encounters during winter when everyone's getting sick. That just doesn't happen for so me. So now do you do the sauna after before, like using the cold plunger? So, you I, just- so I was using the sauna like crazy. Uh, and I've always been pretty consistent with that. It's one of my favorite things to do is to train and then sit in the sauna afterwards here, especially when everybody's kind of gone. I kind of do it by myself. And now we have that little private room. Um, so I've been doing that cause I am not doing them in conjunction cause Doug freaks You're doing out about, more cold right about the sweat getting inside the, the bathtub. So I uh, won't do that. I don't if you did it after it wouldn't matter. Yeah, I could do it after. And I thought about doing that. But I might do that been, today cause I'm going to be there. I'm going to be here for a while today because I have that, I have the NCI call later on. So but lately it's just been cold, just cold lately. Okay. That's the main thing because I already, tra- I actually train the, the, the hot all heat all the time. So I've been, and the, that's the reason why I'm like focused more on cold, but you're, my favorite is to do both. Like when we yeah. go to that, the refuge, Refuge, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, I love the, the contrast and, and bro. And, speaking of contrast and, uh, you know, I guess people who, <laughs> it's a bad commercial, but people who, who use <laughs> drugs have combined uppers and downers for a long time, knowing the awesome effects. Well, anyway, I love this here we going. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't uh, wait for this commercial. One like. of the best, you know, I'm thinking of this right now what, because what? You're, you're drinking uh, nitro, right? Is that nitro? Or yeah, is that yeah, yeah, okay. it's nitro. So nitro, I love nitro yes, coffee. It's the best. It's just, it's, and it's strong, right? Um, the best thing to take with that is- Cannabis and theanine. It, bro. The, the, You're the, the one to introduce that. The hemp, hemp oil? Yeah. The Ned, he, the Ned hemp oil yeah. mm-hmm. with that and yeah. theanine. So theanine relaxes the body. The hemp oil obviously calms you. And what it does is it gives you the great effects of the caffeine and it takes away the negative effects. Because yeah. anybody who's ever taken a lot it's of- It's a very workout, smooth high. It's, it's a very, yeah. It's, it is up and smooth. You just smooth. don't get the jitters like you normally would. Yeah, because one of the, dra- the drawbacks to stimulants when you lift weights is sometimes you get out of breath and it's too hyped and whatever. This makes it so you like focused, clear, and smooth. So you take the hemp oil with caffeine, the best. You introduced that to me even before we were working with Ned. I mean, we, we you had me doing that. Um, I, it's so funny. I re, I can recall the first time I did it was. At, remember when we rented that house on uh, on the Delta uh, when we wrote one of oh, our yeah. programs? Oh, that yeah. one. Mm-hmm. That I I remember that weekend. Like we did a hit did, and split that same weekend. Is that what we did? Yep. I couldn't remember what. Oh we, yeah. What we wrote. We wrote you, you wrote hit. You yeah, went outside. I wrote hit, you guys were finishing up split. Okay, you're right. That's yeah. Right. yeah. So at that house when we did that, uh, I remember we had all the stuff at the house, and so I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do that. And I remember sitting out there with the water, going like, oh, yeah, this that was is, a fantastic combo. Since I've then, the I have been sold. On, it's on the that. best. Yeah. yeah. The, the the hemp oil. I mean, I don't I don't think it's a pre workout, but when you take it with your pre workout. I feel incredible, incredible. It's like the best combination. Now, so like some, I like some it. pre-workout companies. I like it yeah. better because I don't mind the jittery feeling that you get from caffeine and stuff like that when you're going to work out because I feel like I get to get rid of some of that energy. But when I want energy, but I'm going to be sitting like this or like writing or typing or reading, like then I want the alertness that you <laughs> get from like the caffeine or like that. But then I don't want the antsiness that you get. And Bro, that keeps- Try it. Next time you work out and you take your pre-workout, 
take the Ned with it. Yeah, because I've never done that. Watch how you feel when you work out. Hmm. It's like uh, it's like the best stimulant, smooth stimulant effect. You're stronger, way more stamina because huh. your 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 CNS isn't so ramped up. Interesting. Yeah, it's a it's the best combination. Yeah, anyway, I got it, dude. I'm having so much fun at home right now because my youngest every day is doing something new, saying something new, like he's. And I don't know where he got this. What are you, what are you at, 16 months or so? No, he's two years old. Oh, he's two. He's going to turn Duh. two. In fact, he's turning two tomorrow. If I, yeah, tomorrow he's turning tomorrow? two. Tomorrow? Tomorrow's huh? his, I didn't know it was tomorrow's, yeah, his tomorrow's birthday. Tomorrow's birthday. Oh, yeah. wow. Awesome. So he, I don't know where he got this. We don't watch, like we watch, the only cartoons we watch is Franklin. We've watched Cars and we'll watch Mr. Rogers. He doesn't watch anything else. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where he got this. But he started this thing where he'll just, he'll get into this position and he gets into this like superhero position. And he says, and he goes, run. And then he runs yeah. like real fast. Or he thinks he's fast because you could tell he thinks he's going real fast. <laughs> dude, I saw that video. I was cracking yeah, up. Dude. He literally is in this like sprinter pose. He's got his arm all the way back. <laughs> Flash. He's like, go. Yeah. And he goes, go. <laughs> and then he runs. But he repeats it like a hundred times in a row. Oh, he oh, stops. Yeah, he does up. it again. So then again, I don't know where he got this from. I'm like, I'm going to put a cape on him. And I'm going to see if he, if he gets excited about it. Now, he's never seen a superhero movie on that, right? So there's got to be something, I don't know, instinctual about it maybe. So I, I got a towel and I put tucked it in his shirt. And I said, now run fast. Bro, it's like I gave him like turbo juice. He's <laughs> Of course. <laughs> and you can tell on his face, he thinks he's like. <laughs> yeah. And I encourage Wind. him. And yeah. I encourage him like, you're going so fast. I can't even see where you're going. He's like. Ugh. Two to five has to be some <laughs> of the best years, dude. I, I really think. Oh, and yeah. I, I mean, I'm only at three right now, but I've had, you know, five-year-old brother and sister before. I've had five-year-old nieces and nephews. And just at that time, the, the, the <laughs> development of the brain is so neat. I mean, it seems like. And right Every now. Every day, too, they'll surprise you. Yes. Every like right now, he Max is at this place right now where like he'll all of a sudden surprise you with like a full blown sentence altogether out of nowhere that you didn't yeah. even know or a word that you had no idea or a phrase or a thing he picked up because he's going to school right so he is around all these other kids and they play all day so he'll all of a sudden have this behavior or thing he's doing that I'm like where did he get that I didn't teach him that you know we we totally do not even realize how. Uh, how much work is happening in their brains to have them leap so quickly. Like as adults, you don't leap like that at all. You don't even come close to that. It takes you years to make a leap that a, like a two-year-old will make yeah. in a week. Yeah. In one week. Yeah, it's yeah. it's super crazy. They're, I think their They're brain- like a cheat code. It's just like, boom. Well, their brain actually prunes neural connections as they get older. So it's not like they, they have to prune them because they have so many that the brain has to kind of fine tune itself. Yeah. That's how like plastic- it is when it learned when you know in terms of learning and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's good stuff. Yeah, Any anyway, uh, good time with that. So I saw a, a a tweet. Was it a tweet? I think no. It was on Facebook, and it was so infuriating uh, because people have a fundamental misunderstanding of success. But to be more specific, billionaires. Mm. People just really have. So right now, Elon buys Twitter. So right now he's being targeted by all kinds of people. Right and. In fact, did you see the did you see the fact checking that happened on the White House? Yes. Oh my <laughs> it's god, it's hilarious. I love right it now. so much. Ew, it's yeah. just good to balance everything out. They did a post where it said, um, you know, senior citizens got the biggest increase in Social Security in, over the last in the last ten years. Then the fact checkers or context, whatever they put context was, that's because inflation, because it has to match inflation, is the highest that it's been in decades. So they got you know, so obviously the White House was embarrassed. They took the tweet down. They actually had to delete deleted their own tweet, which makes it look even worse. And more, That's hilarious. Yeah, to me. it's crazy. Well, anyway, there was a post about billionaires, and people were commenting. And this one person, the post was, "It's easy to become a billionaire when you start out with a million dollars." And then someone, <laughs> someone said, underneath said, that, somebody who's never had said a no dollars. entrepreneur yeah. ever. Uh, yeah, and so I, it's funny because th this is the reality now. It's exponentially easier to go from zero to a millionaire. Than it is to go from a hundred million to a billion, a hundred million, not just a million, but a hundred million to a billion. Yeah. This is why there's so few billionaires and so why there's so many millionaires. A lot of people have no idea just how difficult 
and challenge it. Well, much- and, and the point you were kind of describing to me earlier when you brought this up, it, it was just like he's got in every industry that is the most difficult. It's almost like you, you're Impossible. setting yourself up for failure immediately. Like, I want to get into the auto industry. I want to get into rockets. Like, are you kidding me? How do you like, how do you even like create something that substantial where it's successful almost right out of the gates? Four, four billion, I think four companies, right? Four billion dollar companies or three? Well, I don't know how many he's got. The, the solar, Tesla, he's the uh, rocket. PayPal, I guess you could get out, right? Yeah, he's got more than that. Yeah. yeah, he's got more than that. I mean, he <laughs> built that many billion billion dollar companies. Uh, yeah, and it's, the, it's insanely but impressive. I, the last time you talked about him, you got a, we got a bunch of stuff. I, I forgot what everyone was saying on YouTube. So the last time you you were talking positively about him, there's there's always like, he's like, he's very polarizing. So he has- I don't a, know the guy personally. He could be no, an asshole. But he pisses everybody about, off and that's why I like him. It's yeah. like, yeah. He, 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 like he was saying, like this is working I, because I, right and left are pissed. I, I get where- uh, the the mistake though that I think were the the fallacy around um you know if I just had a million dollars or if I got a start like that I, I would be able to do that I mean there was a time when we were in this business and I remember us talking about it that and we were scaling and growing and all oh, it's starting to get a little bit of traction that we would we would have fun and speculate oh man could you imagine if we just somebody you know threw ten million dollars at us to go and yeah. do all these things that we want to do and stuff like that and in your head you think like. Yeah, that would be. Oh my God! If that would just oh, yeah. happen, like we would crush. We'll just hire these people. No, yeah, we'd hire these people. And we'll ab- <laughs> we'll ab- people here. we've hired and they've failed. Yeah, and know? so, like, the, but the truth is, and we know from just even the experience in the last six, seven years that probably all the things that we would have thrown a million to ten million dollars at six years ago, compared to what we would today, is totally different. And we probably would have actually lost all of that. Through those ideas, like yeah. you know, Justin's porn advertising idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. oh, <shit. laughs> we that we all agreed made on. money because <laughs> that, we, <laughs> that we all thought was brilliant. <laughs> we all worked on it for like two days. Hey, you guys just didn't go all in. Yeah. It was our bad. We just flirted with the <laughs> yeah. idea. Yeah, okay. it, was, it was our bad. I mean, yeah. but really though, exactly. I for just, you to nah. become a billionaire, unless you steal it or you're you know that you're forced, you're, like the government forces people to give you money. Let's say you're a pharmaceutical company that that the government requires everybody to buy from. Let's say you do it in a, in a market, okay? If you become a billionaire in a market, it's because you innovated at such a tremendous level that so many people found you valuable enough to give you their money. So you've literally done something like so difficult, so challenging, and what society has deemed to be so valuable. I say society because it could go in a lot of different directions. Or you created a market that didn't really exist. Well, I mean, that's innovative. Because right, you're the first one there, right? First one there so you can get away. I mean, imagine how uh, like ex- expensive some things were until everybody got into the space and made it competitive. That's right. right. So when you're when you're first to market in, in, a, in a brand new uh, emerging market, you get a chance to, to reap a lot of the spoils until everybody else comes in Dude, and then makes it competitive. Space shuttles used to just like come back in pieces. <laughs> you couldn't use them again. Yeah. He was able to figure out how to bring him back the, and uh, land so, himself. So that is, okay. So if I if if and I understand, cheaper, by the so way. if I understand Crazy. it correctly, SpaceX is is not so much the the profitable side of the. It's because he created Starlink and some other things off of it. Starlink right? and right. also companies pay him to use their rockets to launch satellites. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. He, what he did was he said, "I want to fly to Mars," and then he created a profitable billion dollar company to, so that he to could fly to Mars. That. Right, like impossible. Yeah. Then he said, "I'm going to start a car." Co-. First of all, the auto industry. But before Tesla, so because now people think, oh, it's open. But you know, before that, like it was the hardest industry to go into. So regulated, so controlled, so much red tape, so right. impossible. Like you had the big automakers, and then you're going to introduce a new auto company. Like good luck. He not only did that, but he's going to. I'm going to make it electric. Yeah. And I'm going to innovate, and I'm not going to go through car dealerships. We're going to sell it directly. And he turned it into uh, a billion dollar competitive. So what do you guys company. think is going to happen um, with Twitter? What's your prediction? Well, I don't know, man, because Good question. he's gonna he has to he's changing the model, so he could fail. Did you say the did you see the news about Vine? What he he had them think do? about working with them? No, so he they own so they own Vine. That was a Twitter oh, that was a Twitter product originally. I don't know that. And so they have the code to it. So I guess he reached out to the original coders or whoever that created the code for Vine and said, "Let's revive it or supposedly bring it to me." I don't know what what the exact conversation was. But there's now rumors around him potentially, which I think is brilliant when you look Smart. at Snapchat, Instagram stories, Reels, yeah, yeah, all the things that uh, these short, yeah, TikTok, these short have you, videos. Have you? Are you guys familiar with WeChat? That's WeChat. That's WeChat. Isn't that the, the Chinese social media? No, it's not WeChat. It's called something else. It's called. Um, 
Yeah, there is a WeChat. I think there's. I, I what think that's the, what you're thinking of is the one that is like all encompassing. Pay you can yes. pay people. You can. Yes. Is that what it is? I think it's WeChat. Maybe Doug. Look. I up. know exactly what you're talking about. So somebody that speculated that maybe Elon's going to kind of look to them as like. Well, a I model. mean, with his with his background in PayPal, he would be the right. person to do that for right. sure. And that's what they say is the thing that's really missing with a lot of these social media platforms is the merging of that. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it WeChat? Is that the right name? I think so. It might be. Yeah. I'm not sure for. Yeah, it's it basically it's it's basically well, in 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 China it's the all in one platform. Yeah, right. They it's used got, to pay. They used to do social media. I heard it. so they were speculating that he wanted to have like for your your blue badge you'd have like an eight dollar monthly charge yeah, yeah. or something like that just to kind of like incentivize some kind of continuity uh, that he's going to add into it. It's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I think so. so. I I mean that's. Besides that, like, I, I don't know that, like, the model of Twitter, I don't think, because it's so effective at just being sort of uh, your your first thoughts, like somebody reporting something immediately. It's like people actually, for news, they, they start going to Twitter uh -oh. exclusively, right? Well, I mean, I, I, think he can, I think he can make the company extremely profitable by simply cutting the staff in half and making a model just like that where you pay for verification. Yeah. And anybody who pr provides the right information to prove who they are can get verified through payment and proof. Uh, is that the, is that it? Yeah, it looks like WeChat. <coughs> okay, cool. They do have payments. They have uh, okay, voice, that video. That's the, the one. Whole nine yards. That's that. I was reading an article and someone was saying that speculating maybe he'll go in that direction because mm -hmm. that's so successful. Yeah, in China. Okay. I I mean uh, I don't know. All I, there was a comment. He did a I think a tweet or he commented and said that something like he had. I don't remember. It was like 10 managers for every coder. Yeah. yeah, That's what he said. You know, I don't know if that was like a serious code or it was like a sarcastic thing he said, but I saw the same thing that it said that like, there's like someone asked him like, what's one of the biggest problems he sees. Mm. And that was his response. Let's see was, what happens. Let's see what happens. It'll be really interesting. I mean, with his track record, you have to bet on him, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. Although I'm like, I don't know how you're going to do well. Well, I, I just think it'd be great is if he can really kind of sift through all the bots and figure that problem out and, and make it more like more real people involved on there that have voices that you can sort of trace back. This is a real person versus like, I, you have no idea. Uh, the, thing, the thing I'm most interested in is how he, he navigates the current climate with the, you know, how do you regulate what is, is acceptable on the platform and not. And we've had debates on here before where you guys have said things about, you know, Zuck and, yeah. um, and them. And I'm, and I've been like, you know, these guys, it's they were more position. libertarian when they started these platforms. This idea that they are. You still have to make it a business people want to visit. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, and so I don't, I don't think they were these, you know, hardcore liberal type of, of, of people that are running these platforms. I really think that they are down the middle, but then now they get all these outside pressures of what you're supposed to do. And then I, I think they get, they succumb to that. So mm -hmm. what I'm curious about, we know where Elon is and we definitely know that he's not easily manipulated in that direction. So if anyone was going to push back on those, like the government or someone are leaning in on him, he would be the guy. I, so how is he going to navigate these, these, you know, tough situations where it's like, do you deplatform this person? And I heard, so that? I heard uh, someone explain it this way. I thought this was brilliant. One would be to have a terms like here's what we allow and what we don't allow and to be very basic and clear and, and try to stay as black and white as possible. So not a lot of interpretation, you know, like, you know, with the way social media is now, you could say something and they'll be like, Oh, that's, hate speech like what you know because there's very clear hate speech and then there's like well i mean depends on the angle and what you're so something that's black and white and stick to that and then the other one i, I uh, explanation i heard or or uh, you know idea was to have you as a user be able to choose an algorithm that was from uh freeburg and i think that's brilliant brilliant right yeah i think like that, you could choose the to algorithm me that, to me that's the answer is nothing gets censored you as the consumer decide what you want mm, censored. that's right so if that you want this type of stuff that would go in this cat fall in this category then you charge i don't want none of that stuff you yeah. want no political no religion no bad language no it's like okay and then now they have built right in the software that it just oh if that gets flagged it doesn't get removed it just gets now categorized in only these people will be able to see that because you're talking about x y and z to me that is a really brilliant smart. way to run a true true free freedom of speech type of platform without like instead of government daddy coming in and yeah 
have then, then you as the consumer get to, to choose that. And yeah. I think that's that's the way and allow the people that are okay with those types of things or want to hear I that. like that too because what an easy counter. Oh my God, I can't believe you guys allow, change your algorithm, make sure you don't yeah. see it. That's, yeah. all you. that's up to you. Yeah, you opt out of it. Opt out of it and you can still use responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I I really, really like that idea and I hope it goes that Dude, direction. Dude, I got sure. to bring up something hel- uh, hilarious. So yesterday I was on the phone with uh, our with some of our customer service people and one of them told me that she got an email from a fan who m- sent a video and said, please let send this to Justin. So this guy created a mobility routine using a lightsaber. Want to show Justin? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't he just send it directly to me? Why, why are you my middleman? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe because they knew we were going to give you well, a hard time. No, yeah. she showed me because she's like, I don't want to send this to Justin. So I'm like, no, thank you for showing me this. I don't want to deliberately make fun of what you guys are doing, Okay. <laughs> And he, hey, in yeah. the video, the guy does like mobility stuff. He's got like this, obviously a fake, because there's not real lightsabers. Yeah. And you can hear him explaining the moves. And first, then you swing over here and then you use a reverse grip. Yeah. And then you, and I'm like, this is so uh, Justin. Because you oh, know, yeah. <laughs> when the cameras are off, Justin's going to go do so that shit. Dude, I, I, I'm all about it. I think it's so cool to see, uh, you know, because when the show first started, it wasn't big enough to really see like a, a, a difference in the audience. There is a very clear. Yeah. <laughs> like group of people that follow each of us individually. There's yeah. obviously plenty of people that uh, enjoy the conversation, enjoy everybody. Um, but then there's definitely like people that are like, they are Justin people for yeah. sure. And like, I feel like that would actually be a fun the thing overhand to do. Is get like, if we strike. got like, yeah. uh, if we got like 20, uh, like hardcore mind pub listeners, right? Consistent listeners. And we got 20 profiles of like Instagram profiles that we could go on and look and see if we could. And they, they all admit that, oh, I'm a fan of one, one host more than the other. If we could actually categorize them based off of their, I bet you we would be at least 80 to 90% right. Do you yeah. think so? Or I, maybe a hundred percent. I think it'd be closer to a hundred percent. I think so. I mean, with some of them, right. They'd be too obvious. Yeah. There'd be some that would be very, very obvious. Very obvious. Yeah. Like no one's going to send me a mobility. First of all, no one's going to send me a mobility video, but then especially a lightsaber. <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. It is kind of dead on. I mean, it's, it's my wheel. I even tease people when people send me stuff that I, it's like, do you, this is me, right? You're this, send this to Sal. This isn't for me. <laughs> yeah. So why you ask me that shit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Did you guys ever do that when you were kids where you'd watch like a, karate movie or a kung fu movie and then you go in the backyard and you practice like moves and shit you saw so you guys did that too yeah, of course oh, every kid I was, when I was a kid I actually yeah. had a routine dude I actually literally did at you one try point, and break boards I, of course I did dude and I, I was, ended up breaking oh, my hand are you kidding me <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a real two by four? Oh yeah. yeah I had bruised my whole arm was like <laughs> bruised <laughs> scratched up did you did do you, what I did you quickly realized realize yeah, like, like that, that was a particle board or whatever yeah yeah, yeah I'm gonna like, get the thin <laughs> it's like foam <laughs> or just yeah. my dad taught me too he's yeah. like you're trying to break this against the grain that's why you're, you're yeah. not gonna be able to break it because right. I understand right mm. you know what I did exactly. I wonder if you did this I took a two bike because my dad, you know, would, and he works in construction. So I went in the backyard. I don't remember what movie it was that I watched. It might have been uh, Kickboxer with John, Cla- John Claude Van Damme. That's the one where he does, uh, you know, the Muay Thai or whatever. Uh-huh. And I, I'm like, that's it. I was probably like 11 or 12. I'm like, I'm going to practice every day Muay Thai. So I went in the backyard and just made up. Obviously, I don't know what the hell I was doing, but I practiced every day for like 40 minutes. And there's that scene where he's kicking the banana tree oh yeah yep. and you know and they break it down or whatever with more thai guys will do this yeah. in yeah. thailand yeah and yeah. i was watching this and i'm like i want to practice but i'm gonna start with like my forearm right so i got a two by four and i just thought and i hit it right and it hurt oh and i yeah. couldn't and i was like oh and it didn't work and like, i'm like suck it up do it again yourself. I, I, it's my i'm not doing it i'm not go following through i'm not doing it hard enough bro i literally almost broke my arm <laughs> Yeah, because I was so hard headed. I kept, I, I kept, I hit it harder and harder, and then finally I stopped. <laughs> and I was like, "What am I doing?" I know that. I mean, that tendency didn't completely disappear though, like because I ended up going in and I like trained at a, at a Muay Thai studio for a while, and they would have you like jump rope, and so I was like, "Man, I really need to toughen up my shins a bit," and so I'd go jump rope barefoot outside on the on the cement. And just like, oh, great like trying idea. to like, okay, maybe this is going to help. And this is obviously before I was a good trainer or anything. I was just like, you know, thinking that this would toughen up my shins. And I was going to, and oh my God, I'd get to the point where I could barely walk, Dude. you know, and just would over and over and over again, like try to toughen it up. The first time you kick a heavy bag, because you think, especially when you're a kid and you, you know, I had a, a friend whose dad had a heavy bag in his garage. When you're a kid and you've never hit a heavy bag and yeah. you see the movies, 
a heavy bag looks soft. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they hit it and they have bends and they, you know, oh. I'm like, oh, this is soft. And I went to his garage and I saw it and I went up to it and I threw a heart as hard as I could. <laughs> and I, I almost, I hurt my hand so bad. Oh. I was like, what? <laughs> Dude, I, I thought it was soft. I didn't know too. Like you got to pack them in. Like when you first get them, like, and they, they stuff them and they put everything in them. Like, so there was a whole period where you have to, you have to kick the shit out of it to, yeah. get, to get it to like settle form yeah, yeah. and settle. And, and so I do that. You'd hit like a wrinkled spot and it was, it was like basically just a rock. You just <laughs> kick a rock. And like, I remember just like limping off like, oh my God. You ever hurt. seen them? You ever seen them? So a traditional like thing that they would do to to like quote unquote toughen their shins. I think what they're doing is they're besides micro breaks in the bone, which make it stronger. Eventually. I think they kill the nerves, what they do, That's but what they'll take a is. stick. They'll take a stick. Yeah, they'll grease it. up their, their, their shin and they'll yeah, <laughs> like rake it. Yeah. And I, I, they would do this. I mean, that's basically just get the, the shin to adapt. Right. And be able to handle, do you know it. how much it hurts. Oh, I'm sure. It hurts if I rubbed one across your shins twice, the way that they did it, you would like, you'd want to stop. Because you see them doing it, you're like, oh, it mustn't be that bad. I guess if you do it over time. Dude, no, right I'm away. I'm convinced all these fighters just always, like, fight hurt, injured. Yeah. Like, they're just, they're just, they've figured out how to just not even feel it. Even. Well, I, I, to your point, the, the, the like, micro, micro breaks and tears yeah. actually ends up solidifying. I mean, you've seen, like, trees. I mean, I think I've shared this on the show before where I told you guys, you, we used to do, it's called uh, low-level stress training on the trees for, like, marijuana oh, yeah, plants. Oh, yeah. And so I remember learning about this and I would take when they're at their, when they're in their veg state, when they're not even that big, I would take them and I would, and you'd hear it and you like, and you twist it until you basically, but you're not breaking it to where it would fall over. Just enough. Just enough to where you, you can hear it. And yeah. then it would actually form like this knot and then it would get really solid. And then that would end up being a stronger tree and then it would produce better flowers. Yeah. So when you look at yeah. bone, I actually watched a documentary on this. When you look at bone, it's got this kind of interesting honeycomb kind of mm-hmm. pattern where there's like, like spongy in the middle yeah and- like a sponge right and there's spaces in between what happens over time it was a documentary on karate so old school japanese karate is freaking hardcore and one of the, the 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 practices of old school traditional karate is toughening up the hands where they'd hit boards or they'd hit you know rocks and they'd hit the backs of their hands on things and if you look at an old like a re like a like a traditional karate expert their knuckles are massive and deformed. And this documentary is talking about how what happens is that spongy looking area that creates micro fractures in there and their bones become denser. So they have less space in between in their bones, more less of that spongy looking space and more just solid bone oh, wow. over time. So they literally have harder hands. So you get hit by a karate dude yeah. in the face with their hands, it's like a rock you know, <laughs> in the face. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. How uh, how excited are you guys um, for the live event? It's been almost uh, three years, right? Excited. Has it been Ooh. three years, Doug, when we did Ohio? Yes, almost. Almost I'm three, excited, right, man? I am too. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna be. It's fun. always high energy, dude. Like it, it's fun to just see everybody kind of interact and and be able to jab at you guys and get some like real laughs, not yeah. just like you know silence. <laughs> <laughs> It's, that's that's fun. It's super grounding for me, is what it is. It may, like totally brings me to the roots of like why I do, you know, why I enjoy doing this. Because you know, we we talk, we we get emails. And it's not the same though when you meet yeah. someone in person. Yeah, and then they ask you questions and they talk about maybe something you said or did that really helped them or whatever. And then it brings me back to when I was a like, first trainer. Like what one of the things I really loved about is it. Is there oh, a yeah. part you guys are looking? I mean, th- this is one of the first times too that we've actually organized it like this, where we have this many types of like events with it. Right, we have everything from the live event that we're actually doing with everybody. We have the live interview where some will be able to sit in and listen to us interview Max in the studio. Mm-hmm. We've got the fireside chat that we're gonna we're gonna do that's private. And then we also have the the Christmas party that a select group will yeah. be able to come to. Is there a is there one of those that you're looking forward to most? Mm, the fireside chat. Yeah, that does sound awesome. That's the that's I mean, gonna be a good time. Yeah that I mean for me it's it's always it's interesting because somebody will have a story that always like i'm like no it's not gonna happen you're not gonna make me cry <laughs> it's not gonna do it every and then time I'm this close every time it's like right here I'm like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah there's always somebody with some so powerful that you're like it, it just reminds you you actually imp- impacted somebody on that level it's it, i don't know i just love like the yeah. the main event totally it's funny how it will it will still get you like that and surprise you because when you think about it and that used to happen to you as a trainer but mm-hmm. it happens now at a greater scale and we feel it less. Does that make sense? Like, so when you were a trainer at all times, you guys probably had anywhere between 20 to 30 clients that you were training, right? Somewhere in that range. 
And of those 20 and 30, there was always one or two or three of them that would come around, uh, you know, a, you know, a year that you like life changing, right. Yeah. That would just, I mean, they're forever would be a lifer and they come to you crying and tell you how much you helped them. And so you would get that maybe a couple times a year from people where now we don't get any of that because we're in this, this virtual game, mm -hmm. but we're also reaching way more people than all of us could have ever done combined in our career. And so it's, it's I, I read a lot yeah. of like uh, emails and DMS and stuff of stuff like that. But the difference is you don't have a relationship with the person because yeah, you, you don't, don't know them. them. Yeah. You don't see, them. you don't see them. Yeah, it's different too. When you see yes. when they tell the story themselves, when versus... you see someone in person and then they, they I, I'll never forget this. This is the first, this was only, we were only two years old at the time that the, the show we went to Paleo FX. That's oh, what that it was. Oh, that girl. Oh, yeah. That girl, remember? Yeah, yeah. We were all like there yeah, we, and we were brand new. She did make me cry. Everybody cried. We all way. did. Everybody yeah. cried. We were on our way out and it was like a 17-year-old girl and she like stopped Justin because we were all ahead and then we turned around Justin looked like he was crying. Like, what's going on? We all go over there and she had been hospitalized with an eating disorder and listened to our show in the hospital and she told us how it saved her life. And we were all sitting there, a bunch of grown men, you know, yeah. you know, it just, we all started losing it. And that was, I was like, man, this is crazy. If this is some of the stuff that we're doing, well, I think but you that don't get that often. That one surprised people. us so yeah. much too, because at that time the audience, uh, it was rare to get a young, a young girl like that. That was lis a listener. That yeah. was kind of not our demographic when we first started, started out. So to see that we were like, I would have never guessed uh, like if you say like, oh, you have to paint the picture of someone's life you helped or changed. Yeah. What does it look like at that time? I would have never painted the picture of a 17 year old girl with an eating disorder. Yeah, exactly. And I wouldn't have thought mm -hmm. that we were impacting that 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 demographic of people. So that was a really powerful. I, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened to her because that was like I don't know. six I would years love ago. To find out. Love yeah. to see where she's at now. I know. That was if well, she listens still, let us know. Contact I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. You know who? Con you know who? Uh, God, who was it? Okay, so you know Margaret, how she does yeah. some of our our chat on the on the website or whatever. Do you know who contacted her? Who who she knows personally? Do you guys remember years ago we were doing an episode? This is like maybe a year old or two years old, and we were talking about childbirth. A year, a year or two in, in in the podcast. Okay, and we were talking about childbirth, and I said, "Oh man, you know, thank God for modern medicine because women used to die all the time for childbirth. Yeah. So dangerous." And he, remember when a midwife contacted said, no, you're totally yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah. That's not what it's like. I'm a midwife. And it changed my paradigm. I looked into it. I'm like, oh my God, I was so wrong. That person contacted and knows Margaret. Oh, no and way. And said, oh. hey, tell Sal, I'm the midwife that, that, you know, that got him or whatever. Oh, wow. That. that was pretty, that's oh, pretty cool. And she's still, yeah, she's still. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, she's still listening and stuff like uh, that. That's, that's really so cool. cool. Anyway, uh, holidays are coming up, right? So are you guys excited? Are you, yeah. We all have little kids, so they're way fun. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Speaking of that, before you go into your commercial. The, it's not a commercial, but go oh, ahead. it's not. Oh, I thought you were, thought you were transitioning to a commercial. <laughs> I was like, this Sorry. Is a good setup. Yeah, very good setup. Uh, <laughs> so good. Here I'm, I'm go anywhere with this. <laughs> Let me ruin your commercial. Okay, no. I didn't, uh, did you see what Amazon is doing this year? So brilliant. What are they doing? So brilliant. Uh, so somebody, you just cut me off. Talking about your own thing. No, I, mean, <laughs> I don't want to steal the whole. With a whole sorry, you just no, go ahead, go. I, this wasn't planned for me Speaking to talk about. You just you reminded me Amazon when you said that, and I wanted to tell you guys. So go, uh, go, go. Amazon now ships all your stuff right now in these already cool Christmassy bags with the little place to put a name tag and oh, a barcode then, if you wanted it. They did the, the like the whole wrapping for yes, you already. Yes. Yes. Talk no about. I love. See, I love. Wait a minute. I, I thought they were I doing that before. I, they? I've never seen that before. Where you could buy a present and have a gift wrap to the person. No, it's like gift wrap. No, it's it like comes wrapped like a present. Yeah, it comes in like a like a present with a like a bow around it, and then it like has, they really make it. A yeah, deal. yeah. It, so I have I had it out there earlier. Someone fantastic. Isn't that cool? Yeah. That, well, that's smart. I think they they had to because so many people were. You're buying gifts for people across the country or whatever? There it is right there. That's the way to do it. Oh, yeah. well, and even then it's better because, dude, how lame is it just sending out gift cards? Wait, I thought they did that for a long time. I'm almost positive I, I did that I, a I've year been, ago. I, every Christmas, Katrina and I order everything from Amazon in a day. We've been doing that for over five years now. I've never seen really? this. Really? So yeah. either it's a new feature that they're- I don't think it's a new feature. I, I literally, I send gifts to my goddaughter uh, because they're up in Sacramento and we often don't see them for Christmas. And I gift wrap. What does that say, Doug? Uh, yes. Can you find out when that started? I, cause well, anyway, whatever. It's, so it's, you've it's, seen it's that? Cool. You, I have. I have. Yeah. I've never, I've yeah, never, I've seen never seen it. There's a, there's a section you can actually select like gift receipt and gift wrap and it's an extra fee. Mm. 
Yeah, you have to pay for it. Yeah. So exactly. it's not included with everything. Yeah, well, so to yeah. to your question, like, so this year's going to be completely different for us as a family. It's really like we're just kind of throwing the board out and, and we're going to go um, traveling over to uh, Scotland and Iceland. And we're going to, that's like the big present for our family. Wow. Now, are so the boys pissed? Are they okay with that? They're so excited about it. Really? Now, do they think they're getting both? No. Oh, they know. No, they know. Like, they know this is the deal. Like, this is it. Who's getting pissed? It's, it's like my mom. Yeah. And oh, like, yeah. Yeah. They, like, the, you know, because we're leaving, but we'll, we'll do stuff with them before we go. But send them a postcard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wish you were. Remember, here. remember the uh, one of my favorite Christmas movies is Four Christmases. Oh, I love yeah. that movie. Where they yeah. lie to their family about where they're going all the time. Oh, yeah. Caught on the news. Actually, I didn't think about it. We're not going anywhere tropical, though. Yeah, it's yeah. Just like, <laughs> you know, that's okay. It. We figure it's so like. So you didn't lie to your parents and tell them that you guys were doing like something like for the homeless or something like some charity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they can't right. guilt you. you know <laughs> no. No, no. We're, no, I'm like super honest. Like I've learned to do that. But. I well, I, so I'm in a in a unique position because I have you know, I have two older kids, a one younger one, and a baby about to come. My older ones are teenagers, and when they get to like as they start to get into later years, like teen years, the fun of the holidays you start to lose it because you know your kid like Halloween, you go trick or treating with them when they're little. Then they're like 14, 15. They don't want to go trick or treating with dad. They're gonna go with their friends, right? And so you lose that. And Christmas, it's exciting when they're little. When they're teenagers, like, what do you want for Dude. Christmas? Money. You know, like, it's like, yeah. well, let me get you something. No, I don't care. And it's not, it's not the same. Yeah. So I get the two little ones and I get to relive. Yeah. You know, but it comes with the, at cost. This is the right? last year ever believes in Santa. Yeah. hundred percent. He's already borderline. And like, we're trying to help have Ethan help us keep it alive. Yeah. yeah one more year. Well, so I, so my older kids are going to do that with the younger ones now. So they yeah, are exactly. going to do the whole, like, you know, he, he does his gifts and all that. And right? we're going to do the, like, you know, the, we're, we're going to have fun with it. Make it look like reindeer walked into the house mm -hmm. and Santa Claus was here and everyone's yeah. going to play along, you know? So it's going to be a lot of fun with yeah. the little ones. So I'm excited about it. Now I was going to say it comes at the cost, like a no sleep. Lots of stress. Obviously, you know, little kids are just whatever. <laughs> is, is this the commercial? No, it's not yeah, a commercial. Where's the commercial at? What would that be a commercial for? I don't know. But sometimes you get really good Nutmeg. at being able to shoehorn it in. Go to <laughs> smallkidsforchristmas.com yeah. forward slash my phone. <laughs> we got a new partner I don't even know about. If you're not enjoying your holidays, we'll send uh, you a small kid. You can the new one. Organifi Nutmeg Protein Powder. No, no, no. Know. All right, Come here's on, a commercial. Man. I just looked this You're up. You're going to create that now. You I, I just looked this up. Okay. The delivery method for nutrients makes such a big difference where if you take a supplement, you take vitamin C, you'll absorb a certain amount. If you take it in a form where it's absorbed or delivered to your, to your target tissues better, you'll absorb far more. It makes a huge difference. And th this is for Live On. So Live On does the liposomal technology, yeah. which is a phospholipid. And it uses the phospholipids as a way for your body to absorb them more. So even something that's water soluble, like vitamin C, like they have a vitamin C, mm -hmm. you look up the research on it, liposomal vitamin C, you just absorb and utilize way more. So mm -hmm. it's like all nutrients and they have lots of, they have like a B complex, they have glutathione, they have magnesium. I said vitamin C and others. Uh, it, you take it in this form You'll you'll notice a difference if you're not absorbing enough of your old. Yeah, you're you're version. good about handing me over the the smelly juice. Yeah, to, <laughs> he to was taking it. Today. I saw him taking it today. It's so yeah, it's Wait, so, so why if that's true, Sal? Then why why don't all these other supplement companies use this technology? It's expensive. Oh, it is. It's more expensive. I'm not sure if it's yes. It might be available to other people as well, but I know it's expensive. And it, especially the way Live On does it, I mean, it, it, you got to deal with the taste and all that stuff. That's that's what I uh, thought. I was like, you know what? Like, how crazy is that? That like you had what a risk you take as a supplement company like them of going like, you know, we are forget we're, we're going to just throw out the whole taste thing because this is people are taking it for a nutrient deficiency or they need something. Yeah. So we'd rather give you the best possible and we're going to sacrifice that. There's, I, I feel like there's Just only a the wrong ingredients, certain percentage of people that will appreciate that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, of, uh, you know, sub liposomal technology and they have a glutathione, which by the way, if you drink alcohol mm. on a regular basis, you should look into supplementing, with things that raise glutathione or that provide your liver with glutathione. Really? Yeah, yeah because the liver is being stressed with alcohol. I feel, like I, the, I feel like I never heard about glutathione until COVID. And now I've heard it a ton of, for, and now I'm continuing to hear it positively for so many other things. It's starting to sound like it's one of those. It's the, it's the master antioxidant. So mm -hmm. it's literally the main antioxidant in the body. Okay. So, and if your levels are low, not good. 
Um, and if they're right, you're doing good. And you could take too much, of course. Okay, I don't well. know if this is true, but I've actually heard some people that have taken glutathione and they've gone out for like a night of drinking and actually like they, it was a little sketchy because they felt like they could drink a lot more than they normally could. I don't know about that. I yeah. don't know about, but I do know that um, your if your liver is being stressed, the there it is utilizing a lot of this antioxidant and it could be, it could have not enough. And so yeah. supplementing with this, can make and glutathione's got other effects too. Help like it to recover. Yeah, I think that's the appropriate way yeah. to use it. I now, just speak, heard that. Speaking of alcohol, there's a there's this article, a study that just came out. So Dr. Rhonda Patrick just shared this and I I pulled it up. There's a hormone that's produced by your muscles when you work out that uh, it's called the FG F21 hormone. Okay. FG F21 hormone. This hormone in animal studies, when they give it to animals like mice and rats and uh monkeys reduces their alcohol consumption by 50%. So for whatever reason, this particular hormone reduces your cravings and desire for mm. alcohol or in animals. Now, this also may be why we've seen in studies on exercise, when people exercise, they tend to want to drink less alcohol. Now, it was believed before that this is mainly due to the psychological effects. Like, oh, I'm doing something for my body right. and my health, so I'm right. probably going to eat better and I'm going to reduce my alcohol. But it may also be because of a physiological effect where you work out, you produce more of this hormone. This hormone makes you want alcohol less. Interesting, right? Very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. So they're going to look more into it because right now we just have animal studies, but this could be like potential treatment for people who have issues. Oh, with. that's wild. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely made that connection, but I always thought it was like a psychological. That's thing. what I would say yeah. too. And yeah. that's where I'm going to lean still because these are animal studies, but interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of this hormone before. Yeah. All right, what does the daily symbiotic do for you? Well, it supports benefits in and beyond the gut. So seed will support ease of bloating, healthy regularity, but it will also support your gut barrier, skin health, heart health, and micronutrient synthesis. This uh, is my favorite probiotic company by far. You got to check them out. Go to seed.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump for 20% off your first month of seeds daily symbiotic. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Ivan from Florida. Ivan, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, man. Wow. Uh, as always, um, it, just got to start off. Uh, I'm really grateful to be able to be on the show, uh, having the opportunity to listen to you guys just for a, sh a few months now. And I've gleaned so much information, um, just kind of binging two or three episodes a day now. And I, I, I just am, I'm really I'm really stuck on you guys. So awesome job. Great job putting out the content. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, for sure. All right. So uh, here I am. Uh, I'm a, a new, relatively new trainer here, just about a year of actual practical hands-on experience here. Um, and what I found myself in is getting, trying to understand how to more accurately use our bodies, right? So um, I've been encouraged to find a new hobby. So here I am, I found uh, adult league ba uh, baseball. So I'm getting back in the baseball scene, uh, 40 years old, I have felt very comfortable in the gym setting, felt very comfortable with the way that I move my body and can control it. Um, however, when I was approached with getting back into baseball, my mind is just like, fuck yeah, you were going to go do this. However, my body is saying, no, we're not, we're not doing this the way that we used to, you know? Um, so getting back on the baseball field 20 years removed from the last time I was on the field things are not functioning the same way, you know? So I'm noticing that uh, my body moves. There's different, uh, you know, discrepancies in the way that my body is moving um, and that I can feel like my, some of my muscles may not be firing on all cylinders the way that they should be. And granted, I understand some of that kind of comes with age, uh, but I also feel that I still have the ability to be athletic and to be explosive and still generate uh, a certain amount of force and skill um, into being an optimal player for my age. And the second part of that idea is um, I have, being a trainer, I've got a lot of clients who are newly retired and they're getting back in the athletic scene for in some degree as well, maybe playing tennis or golf or picking up pickleball. So they may have come from a, a deconditioned kind of state, you know, maybe being in an office or whatever the background may be. Um, and I'm hearing some of those same kind of aches and pains that you're dealing with. Oh, I, I can't reach the same. I don't have that same flexibility or that same dexterity and the power that I'm looking for. 
And there's so many other things that go into that, like being able to accelerate and decelerate um, and use our body in ways that uh, can be very uh, performance driven on the court, but at the same time, just functional in real life as well. So my question is, how do I, being at my age and also kind of coaching those who are a little bit older, how do we take our bodies and kind of mold that into a functional uh, motions, but also how we can still kind of have a good experience getting back into sports and being physically active? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I want to comment on that real quick. I think a lot of the reasons why people who are 40 who have an athletic background notice aches and pains is less to do with their age and more to do with the fact that they just yeah, they just not lost the skill. The same patterns anymore. Yeah, it's it's all skill, right? It's all skill, and how your body moves is uh, in sports is very skill focused. Now, will you get slower as you get older? Eventually, yeah. Will you not be as explosive? Yeah. <clears throat> but if you lose the skill, forget about it. Um, Hence, Tom Brady, right? I mean, excellent, excellent yeah. uh, example. So, so all right. So, real quick, you said, how do I do that? Well, slowly, and you start one step at a time, and that should include practicing the sport at low intensity levels. Like the easiest way to hurt yourself is to go play without building your body up to, or to play hard without building your body up to that capacity because the risk of injury becomes really high um, in that scenario. So it's like train your body slowly, multiplanar, and then slowly practice your sport at low and then moderate and then high uh, degrees of intensity over a period of time. Yeah, I would say like to reiterate that, like mainly on the slow part is to get through those movements, like the movements that you're less familiar with, like, you know, that you've lost a bit of range of motion, especially with any kind of a, a rotational movement, a shoulder rotational movement. Um, this is something that I found was was kind of like uh, the, the best thing I could have done in terms of like, I decided to sign myself up for a football game later on in life when I'm almost 40 years old, which is a ridiculous idea. Uh, and everybody thought I was crazy. But, um, you know, what I did focus on was not so much about like, I'm going to be so strong and like in shape going into that. It was more like I need to focus on a lot of these movements that my body's not familiar with uh, leading up to this. So that way it can respond appropriately. Uh, and so we were, we were focused a bit more on the mobility side of it and just trying to reconnect, uh, with a lot of the lateral movement, a lot of the rotational movement, a lot of stability. Um, so in terms of like a, a list of priority, I, I highly suggest like if with any ex athlete that they just take the time to get your body to go through those ranges of motion, connect with them, add isometric tension to them. Um, so that way too, you're, you're better connected. So that way now you can add some more stress. You can add some more load and then work your way up sort of that, that ladder again to get to the explosive, the, the, you know, the acceleration, the deceleration, you know, the, the force generation, all of that takes a base again. So to, to kind of take it in those steps and be, uh, you know, uh, methodical about that would be my suggestion. Well, this is really, this is maps performance. Yeah. So Ivan, I'm going to have, uh, Doug send maps performance over to you. Uh, so you can use that. I think that's a great place. That's a perfect program. Yeah. That's a great place to start. And really what it is, it's, it's the, the stuff that, Justin was highlighting that we, you know, as we get older and we stop playing sports, we really stop moving in the frontal plane. We don't do a lot of stuff in the transverse plane. We don't do a lot of rotational and anti-rotational movements. <laughs> and that's really where the injuries occur or why you feel slow or less responsive is that you've just, you've stopped doing movements like that. And so, and then you go on the, on, on a field or playing uh, baseball and those movements are required and then you and your brain tells you, I know how to do this because I did it for many, many years as a young guy, uh, but you haven't done it in a long time. So the, the body doesn't seem to catch up. And that's where injury tends to occur. So laying the foundation uh, with like a maps performance type of a program with Sal's advice of, you know, getting back to playing the sport, but being very mindful that, you know, just because you could do a lot of those things in the past that you 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 haven't uh, you got to play slow. Yeah, yeah, you haven't built the, the the foundation. I mean, this is what keeps I love basketball. It's one of the Katrina and I were just talking last night. I miss it so much. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I just don't get up and just go play ball is because I know that I haven't built the, the a foundation <laughs> that I should before I get out on the court because my brain it's really tough when I because I played for so many years. I right away will want to start to do 
certain moves and play at exp at a certain rate. And I just, I haven't laid the right foundation for that for my age. And so, and because I've neglected it for so long. So performance is the, is yeah. the place I would start. And that's really where performance, that was a big part of our motivation was to address that. Cause there's a lot of people out there that just want to get into recreational sports and like continue because sports are awesome and they're fun, but it puts a lot of wear and tear and stress on the body. And so, I mean, if I was to kind of stack our programs together for somebody that's like, you know, been out of the game for a bit and wants to kind of really do a good job of addressing a lot of these issues, I would go prime, I would go symmetry, then I would go performance. So, you know, Look into that as is a potential option, but it yeah. would help cover the basics. Symmetry would be perfect before or after, right? Performance right. would be great, and then Prime is just going to show you some of those movements that'll help you work on on con connecting to different uh, ranges of motion. You know, as far as time timeline is concerned, because you're fit, because you've been working out, it's not like you're not fit. So we're not dealing with a deconditioned person, and because this was something you did quite a bit, but 20 years ago, and there's going to be some muscle memory there. Obviously, it's not like you're never played baseball before. So because you're fit, I could see you're not overweight. You're obviously at a, at a good body weight. Uh, you just haven't practiced play, playing baseball for a long time. You should give yourself about six months at least before going to play hard baseball. That would be the safe thing. So I, I would give myself six months of working up to being able to go and play hard baseball. And so, and, and then here's the other mental challenge. Like Adam talked about this with basketball. You could go play baseball, just play at a low intensity and play slow so you get used to the movements again, mm -hmm. just like Adam could go play a slow game of basketball. But I know Adam, and I know that when he's playing, it's not going to work that way, right? Because he's going to be playing the game. And, and how the hell do I play this game without playing hard, right? So if, if you got to get it, really, really have that discipline to be able to do it. And it may mean you go out in the field by yourself and you mock play and you play slow and you do this two days a week and then three days a week and then four days and you play a little harder and then you go play with like a bunch of men who are like, you know, way older than you. So you're playing at their speed and then eventually go down to like, you know, recreational players and then competitive players at your age. But I give yourself about six months just to keep it safe. Gotcha. And I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I really appreciate the feedback there. Uh, the league that I am that I am in is 25 and older. Uh, being 40 years old, I'm one of the younger ones on the field. So I, I feel like I do have that advantage. But I'm also looking at these older players and, you know, they're coming off limping or Monday they're calling off the work because yeah. they're just like out of they're out of the game altogether. You know, so I'm trying to avoid that. And I've listened to you guys long enough to hear you say like, just focus on mobility, focus on joint health. And those are certainly key things that I really want to ensure that I'm touching on and being very conscious of, because also I need to take care of my own body because I'm going out and, and training and teaching classes and, mm -hmm. and doing one-on-one -on -one sessions. Yeah. So for me to have a, a functional and still, you know, athletic uh, body and purposeful, then I need to, you know, just be mindful of, yeah, of re those joints. One last thing, Ivan, before we let you go, I want to make sure that you understand. Yes, mobility is important. Yes, joint integrity is important. But what's equally as important is re is le relearning how to apply the skill of what you're trying to do. Because you can have general mobility, but then you can go try uh, playing a sport and you're not familiar with a particular movement or skill and still place yourself at a, a at a unreasonably high uh, you know rate of injury, for example, or risk of injury, I should say. So it's not just mobility and joint integrity. It's mobility, joint integrity, stability, and Skills I got to relearn training. the skill. There's a way that you move. You know this as an athlete or as, as an ex-athlete. You know that there's a way that you move that, yeah, you can have strong muscles and you can do all whatever, be flexible. But if you don't know how to move that way or you have to relearn it, like that's that takes time. So it's, it's all of that stuff. Thanks for calling in, Ivan. By the way, I want to make a comment. He said, oh, yeah, it's guys that are older than me or my age. I've seen guys in their 40s and 50s who have continued to play yeah, and did a really yeah. good job. And they're, they're, they're well, why they up. never stop. That's yeah. why I brought yeah. up Tom Brady. Right. I mean, yeah. what is he, 45 now? 45, 46? Yeah. And he's the best. Uh, yeah, and he's the best in his, in his position. Well, so, Yeah, I wanted to actually through this because Andrew went through this process of, of going uh, back yeah. into baseball. And like, I know, does he have a mic? Because um, I wanted to ask... I wanted to ask you a bit about like what were your first steps in terms of like getting getting back in and and competing at that level again. How come his mic's not plugged in? Well, it's Q and A. He's, he's usually uh, not, put you on the spot. Yeah, uh, yeah no worries. He's usually not club. He's a good person to ask though. So, um, yeah, I have quite a bit to add to this. Doug, I'm sorry. Do you mind if I take a seat? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, producer to pursue, yeah, producer yeah, that, was here. that was a, yeah. that was a flex move. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, take a hike for a little bit. No. Doug. <laughs> Doug's gonna fight you afterwards. You gotta be careful. 
go, go ahead and ask your question again, Justin. <laughs> oh, no. I, so I was going to ask you, Andrew, because you went through this entire process that he was describing about getting back into baseball and competing at like a, a, a high level in terms of a rec league. So you did the same thing. So what, what did you consider first? Yeah. So, um, I mean, for so the audience knows I'm, I'm only 26 years old and going out there, uh, I imagine this guy excited to play. The skill is still there, but your body's just not used to it like it, like it once was. I mean, think about when you're in high school. You're training every day of the week, and now where I'm at, um, not training at all and pretty much just going out there on Sundays, what I realized was I was going to get hurt very quickly. And so what I had to do was basically build up the intensity, like you guys talked about, the skill of it, and break it down <clears throat> on the uh, for each exercise. So like running the bases, uh, throwing, like just going out there and throwing out a net and just kind of building up how much I was throwing or how much I was running. Mm -hmm. And that really made the difference for me. So, so you just broke up the skills. The skills. I broke up the skills. Yeah, so like based on the position. So smart. I'm a pitcher, I play the outfield, I run the bases. And I, when I went out there and I didn't do that and I tore my hamstring and I, my shoulder was throbbing like the next day, <laughs> <on> Monday. <laughs> Dude. And um, so it took me like four weeks to get back into it. So I broke it down and just kind of build everything back up little by little. One day I was just throwing, you know, 20 pitches. And the next day I was just picking it up, picking up the intensity. It's and perfect. You, you know what's wild is someone like you who actually has an extensive background in baseball is at a higher risk than me getting a person who's never played before and then wants to go play. Yeah, because of the muscle memory and because, the way used to play. Yes, because you know the type of velocity that you can put on a ball or how quick you can turn the bases or how you can turn the bat over to swing – your brain will try and do that still. Where someone who's like, it's all foreign, it's like, uh, their body's only going to kind of do what their they body They got to work their way up to that that's kind right. of force. They got to work their yeah. way up to that. And so they're less likely to get hurt, which is not, it's kind of counterintuitive, counterintuitive. Because you think like, oh, I've been an athlete my whole life. Like, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to play right away. When actually, you're at higher risk because of your background and what you, you know that your body's capable of doing versus the total green 26 year old who goes, Hey, I want to try baseball. Never played in my life. Like he's less at risk than well to, you add, to yeah. add to that. Cause someone might be listening like, huh? How does that make sense? When you have a particular skill that you've learned in a, in a sport, it typically involves a type of movement and, and mobility that's specific to that skill. Like, you know how to get down real low, you know how to angle your foot, drive a particular way. And this is all intuitive. Well, all of that requires the capabilities to manage that skill. Now, the average person who's never done that sport, when they're turning the bases, they just turn their body, yeah. uh, not knowing that there's a way you can do it and angle your body. So they just do it in a way where they intuitively aren't going to hurt themselves. So this is why it becomes a problem yep. because you get someone like Andrew, you know how to twist and turn. You know how far back to whip your arm. Whereas if I throw a baseball, it's going to be very stiff and whatever because that's what I do. If I knew, had your skill, I'd be like, no, I got to bring it way back here, whip it over this way. Boom, tore my shoulder. But you kill those carnival games, though. I, that's, <laughs> that's, that's I good. beat you guys all the time. Yeah, yeah, every time. <laughs> One last thing to add to exactly what you're talking about is it's all the antagonist muscles that kind of have to get restabilized. Mm -hmm. So, like, if, even if I was throwing with my right shoulder, my left back was the side that was hurting a lot. And it's because it wasn't used to taking that load. It wasn't yeah. used mm -hmm. to decelerating. It mm -hmm. wasn't used to a lot of that extra work. Cool. And, you know, the audience needs to know that uh, Andrew just, he does our YouTube and he knows more fitness than your trainer does. So yeah, <laughs> that's the staff that we Step have Step your here. game up. That's what we got here. Yeah. Our next caller is Colton from Nevada. Hey, what's up, Colton? How can we help you? Oh, how's it going, guys? What up? All right. I'm just, uh, first off, just want to be that guy, you know, everyone says thank you. And I do appreciate you guys. I like the, uh, the little introduction you guys got makes me laugh at work when I'm at night shifts. <laughs> Keeps me awake. <laughs> Good stuff, man. I, uh, my question for you guys is I'm doing MAPS aesthetic and I, I work as an underground miner over here in Nevada and my schedule is super crazy. So I leave my house at three, like in the morning and I get home to the bus stop at around, oh, seven thirty. So doing the maps, like the aesthetic program, it's, it's taken me like an hour and a half to do the workout. And so by the time I get home, say hi to the kids and eat dinner and go to bed, I'm not falling asleep till like 11. I know you guys are super big on sleep, getting enough sleep. I just want to know if I'm taking too long in between sets or if I chose the wrong program or what I got going yeah. on. Is this 730 at night? 7.30 p.m.? You yeah. Home? Damn, bro. Oh, you, how yeah, the so hell do you have like, that much? I work swing shifts. Yeah, you... I think so you, I work swing shifts. So sometimes it's 7.30 in the morning, sometimes it's 7.30 at night. But it's always I leave it, th leave my house at 3.30 and get home at 7, whether it's 
or get to the bus stop at seven, whether it's a.m. or p.m. I don't know. I don't know how you have so much muscle with that kind of schedule. Look at this guy's. Doing that. <laughs> I know, right? I think it's all just fake. No, it <laughs> it's all just show. I did just get back from the gym. I'm on my days off. So <laughs> you're 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 a miner. I got a sweet pump going. Yeah, you're a miner underground. I'm pretty sure it's real. Yeah. But, all right, here's the deal. <laughs> you need to follow Maps 15. Yeah, I was just gonna say the That's same it. thing. Yeah. I'd say go Maps 15. I think that right away is the better program. Do the advanced sure. version in there, obviously. Yep, yep. Mass 15. And then if that's awesome, the next progression that would be anabolic. So I, aesthetic is just a ton of volume. Yeah. And 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 you don't need it. It does take a long time yeah, to get for, through. Yeah, you don't. I mean, run run Mass 15 and see how good you feel off of that. And by the way, the advance is more like 20 to 30 minutes long. So it's still not like super, super short. But I think that program is perfect for where you're at. And then... If you want more to that, then I would go into anabolic after that. Aesthetic is just a lot, dude. That's yeah. A, it's yeah, a, it's, it's a lot. And I, I've been kind of just throwing my own thing into it. Like the, the nights I get to the gym super late, like, oh, well, I'll make sure I do all my leg workouts because I got little tiny baby legs. And, and so like, <laughs> oh, but I'll, instead of five sets for back, I'll do four sets here, three sets there. Kind of just trying to save some time, but. I don't know if that was bad call or if I just made the wrong wrong choice on the programs. I do like it. Like on days off, I have all the time in the world. It, so it's just. I think you probably have a really high tolerance for workload and stress, which is why you're getting away with what you're doing. But it's way too much volume with a schedule like yours. You actually get better results working out less. You'll get way better results working out less. So yeah, I, yeah, I can't, I can't wait to actually hear your, hear you after you go through this. So I, Doug's going to send you maps 15 on us. So We'll send that over to oh, you. Awesome. And then I would love for you to follow back up with us. Uh, you'd be a great person to, oh, okay. to to hear how that goes after you've been running it for like a month or so. I think you should see see and feel a difference just by scaling back on, on the volume. Totally. Yeah. Do the do the advanced version too, by the way. I, I, I want to make that clear. So there's a there's a beginner version and the advanced version. Do the advanced version. Okay. Sweet. Awesome. Thank yeah. you guys. You got it, man. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. What part, what part of Nevada are you in? Uh Elko. Little tiny. Little tiny minor town, Elko. What's what's the what's the closest? Is, is it near Reno that direction, or is it more south? Like where's it? Uh, it's like four. It's closer to Salt Lake, so oh. it's like three hours away from Salt Lake. Just oh. right in the middle of the desert. No trees for a hundred miles. <laughs> oh, <laughs> out in the boonies. Good stuff, right. dude. Oh yeah. All right, take it easy. Thank you. All right. You know what? I, I got to say this again. There's just some, and it's usually blue collar people. He's probably been doing it for years. Their capacity for stress and workload is so yeah. crazy yeah. that it's so hard for them to realize. They can just handle so much. They man. just don't realize that yeah. they're overdoing it because they're like, well, I always, you know. I'm well, yeah, you what I always do. Well, <laughs> when you when you think about working out, you always think of working out to be more stressful or more challenging than your day-to-day -day life and work. And when your day-to-day -day life is that high, it's like hard to be like, oh, that's all I'm going to do in the gym? Yeah. You know, my work day was harder yeah, than this. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> week. Enough. Yeah, I would but, have the same reaction. But yeah, I mean, he's going to he's gonna blow up, especially carrying, the amount of muscle he's carrying doing that kind of, with lack of sleep and all that. He's going to, He's going to explode. Yeah, oh, I didn't yeah. ask his age. We didn't say it. He says he's got a family, though, right? So is, is he a dad? Does, did I did I read that? In yeah, his, he looks like late 30s. I don't know. Maybe 40. Yeah, in his in his question, he says he's, you know, when he gets home and hangs out with the he's kids. He's like, I'm 20. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, oh, shit. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's a lack of sleep. No. Yeah, that's a, man, talk about a serious schedule, dude. When I hear a schedule like that, it makes me feel like such a wuss. I know. You know? I feel it's soft. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. When I complain about my commute. I'm like sitting here and like... <laughs> I know. <sighs> He's so tired just talking. He takes a bus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fucking crazy. Dude. I had to rake the leaves the other day. I was like, oh, man, I'm too yeah, tired for this. It was like, this is too much. It was like 4 p.m. <laughs> Our next caller is Jess from Ontario. Jess, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Well, um, you know what? I've been an avid lifter and a coach for many years now. And um, I started off in. Um, in high school lifting not really knowing what to do developed an eating disorder from that um and just a uh, whole bunch of bad experiences all along the way uh went into college and started actually learning how to body build to address my eating disorder and kind of a fast backwards way of going around it um you know bodybuilding is not necessarily the greatest place for a person with an eating disorder to go into <laughs> but um, and then I just fell in love with lifting and um, got my exercise science degree, been coaching pretty much ever since, um, spent the last 
uh, about 13 years in the U.S. military, serving as an army captain once I got over, you know, the whole eating disorder debacle. And so I've had a good amount of bodybuilding experience, um, I've competed, and then uh, more of a military athlete type of background, whereas I was always the person to go to for PT and, you know, how do I, how do I lose this flub, sir? Um, and then after that stint, um, somehow I ended up on in Canada. Um, you know, apparently I like French girls and, uh, <laughs> That's a good reason. um, and then, uh, started up my own fitness business up here, um, smash a strength lab and got into heavily into powerlifting, which I really fell in love with. And, um, <clears throat> I, I powerlifted for a good eight years. And then all of a sudden, 40 year old, years old comes along and it's like, oh, wow, um, my joints are just falling apart. I got diagnosed with osteoarthritis and a, um, a, a hip injury, which has kind of shut down the heavy lifting. And so beans, I'm an avid listener of the show. Oh, my wife and I love to listen to you guys when we're on log road trips and whatnot. I was like, you know what? I bet these guys would be able to chime in on some of the, some of the emotional aspects of being a, you know, a really fit person all your life. And then all of a sudden it's just like, you've got this huge roadblock that makes you go, Oh wow. I, I can't do the same stuff I was anymore. And you're just kind of a has been, and you're just kind of going, well, what do we do now? And I feel like a lot of other people will, will benefit from that um because we have such a large population of you know this newcomers into fitness and people that have been in fitness their whole lives like myself and so how do we navigate the mental toughness aspect of like dealing with like well i can't squat 500 pounds anymore mm, yeah this is such a good question and this is why this is really what you're highlighting is when i when i mention how fitness is this kind of unassuming, but very powerful vehicle for personal growth. That's what you're experiencing right now. Like you've already gone through some big changes with your fitness that were challenging, like going from eating disorder to healthy lifting and bodybuilding, right? That was a big shift and it required some serious personal growth. Well, you're just, you're going into another one right now. And, you know, fitness will teach you a lot of lessons if you pursue it appropriately. And if you pursue it and in, in, in keeping yourself or your self-care is a priority because what you're learning now is, well, how do I do this without hitting PRs? How do I do this without competing and driving myself like I did when I was in my 20s and uh, my 30s? And you'll figure it out. And one of the things you'll figure out is how to enjoy it for the sake of doing it. And you'll also figure out that you can have goals that are different. Like maybe your goals before were to get a 500 pound squat, but maybe now your goal is to improve your mobility past a certain point or to be able to get into a position you couldn't get into before or to improve your stability, for example, um, or just maybe the challenge is uh, loving the workout for the sake of doing it. Like this is, it's, and it's not going to stop. Like this journey is never going to stop, Jess. If you meet people in their seventies and eighties who've been lifting weights for decades and decades, I used to love asking this question of those people because they would explain, it would talk to me about like the different times in their lives when they had to go through acceptance, they had to go through what they thought about exercise and how it applied to their life and how they grew from it. So uh, you're going to run into many more of these, these challenges as you continue to do this, but you're going to grow the whole time. That's just, this is really what the journey is all about. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what, what I would do if I was in your exact situation at this, at this part of your journey. Um, and it, cause it reminds me a little bit of where I was just a couple of years ago, as far as how I felt and what was on my mind. Um, I, this is when I got heavily into the mobility thing. So I think this would be a great time in your life to become, I mean, you've been the, 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 the strong, strong guy, the power lifter, you've been the bodybuilder guy. Uh, now maybe challenge yourself to be the, the mobility guru, you know, and try and become that or put your energy, your competitive type of personality towards uh, improving, you know, your, your range of motion and, and joint health and stability and control and, 
uh, and just dive deep into that. This is what I would do. So that may not appeal to you. You may not, well, oh, I don't want to do that. But normally that's how I felt too, which is what made me go that direction is like, oh, I was resistant to it. Mm-hmm. I didn't like that guy. I didn't want to be that guy. But I'm like, I know that the benefits that are there and how ha- have I ever really gone deep in that direction? I feel like you're at a really good place in your life that that might really benefit you. The other thing that I would give as far as advice right now is, this is when I find myself at, at, at moments like this in my journey, I like to find a a movement or exercise that I, I've never really done or I'm not good at and go really deep on getting good at it. So what a great piece of advice. An example yeah. would be uh, for me at one point, I remember I'd never really done a Turkish get up. And, and then that became like this major focus, like I'm going to get good at the Turkish get up and I'm just going to I'm going to break that movement up. I'm going to practice it and, and and try and progress it over time and and get really good at that. Oh, I've, I've never really done windmills like, OK, let me let me get really good at the windmill, which encompasses also all the mobility stuff that goes into it and then also practicing the movement. And so instead of being hyper focused on the strength or my body, now I'm going to be focused more on movement and and that that allowed me to take my athletic competitive mind and shift it in a direction that was probably going to serve me at the place that I was in my, in my current state. Yeah. That the second part about what you were bringing up was what I was going to get into even more. So like from my own journey, it was definitely, I've been in that same situation in place where, you know, the workouts are kind of like, I feel like I've just done most of what I could do in terms of like trying to go for my strength gains, my PRs, like I played sports. You know, I grew up with fitness as like a thing always. Uh, but then I started to find out a lot of unconventional lifts, a lot of tools out there like mace bells and Indian clubs and kettlebells. And um, there's so much skill to that. And and there's a lot to, to learn in that direction. And really for me, it's always about like finding areas of discomfort. Um, and so that could be in any direction of life. For me, it was obviously right here, right now, if me speaking, this was a huge area of discomfort for me. Uh, and I knew that there was opportunity for me to grow in this direction and I didn't want to, but I did it anyways. And that this is just like sort of an MO, uh, you know, that I, that I've found within myself of just finding those opportunities, either rising to them or, or avoiding them. Um, but that's, that's all things you can find within the fitness setting. There's, there's a lots of opportunity for that, whether it's mobility, whether it's, uh, you know, learning a new skill or, you know, you obviously you've done the bodybuilding thing and, and there's different pursuits in those directions. Um, but there's, there's lots and lots of, uh, areas in fitness, in health, um, that you can kind of, uh, find like, oh, wow, that sounds scary or that's something I would never do. Uh, and I would lean all into that and, and just, you know, it, it may feel a part that, uh, was void that, that may, you know, encompass more of a holistic, um, perspective that you didn't have before. Yeah. And it, and that keeps it fun. Yeah. All, you know, all of that keeps it fun the entire time because it's so fun to learn d- different things and to, uh, push yourself in different ways. So I, I, I love what you guys just added. Yeah. Embrace 100%. the suck. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it makes it fun. It really does. Like, it, there's so many different skills and things you can learn and practice. And uh, you know, you, maybe you spent the first half of your lifting career trying to make light, uh, heavy weight feel as light as possible. Maybe now you try to make heavy weight feel as light as possible. Right? It's like that's another direction you could go. There you so, go. Um, but it's it's going to be a journey. You're going to run to more of this uh, as you continue to get older. But I hit that one right around your, you know, a couple of years ago too. I think we're all in the same age group. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's challenging for sure. So like one the one option with using kettlebells is not something that i'm not familiar with i've i've branched off into using you know i've always used kind of a hybrid method of training anyway like we use kettlebells and um the prowler sleds whatever tool we have that is actually a a decent training tool other than bosu balls we don't use bosu balls at all because those are just garbage but um (laughs) finding finding with you newer techniques and different ways to kind of um, like using uh, resistance bands in combination with barbell training or dumbbell training has proven a fairly useful tool, I think, um, in terms of just trying to push the muscles harder, but not really push the joints as hard. And I wondered if you guys had any like perspective on that type of like unusual training methods that type of thing well have you ever have you gone hard hardcore on suspension training before where you ran your entire program like olympic rings the olympic rings i got into that yeah so one 
one aspect that I'm going to try to pursue is getting more gymnastics type training, oh, there you go. which is, um, you know, a, a whole great new thing for me in terms of, you know, just body weight calisthenics and making just movements with the body hard. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that combined, combined with isometric training, combination of cables and bands, and then, you know, whatever barbell or dumbbell move feels good we'll keep that in the program and then just keep on developing it from there so you know my kind of new mission right now in life is just to try to you know branch out and see what i can do for other people that are having the same issues and are kind of like at a stop roads it's like well i used to be like super awesome and now i'm like super flat <laughs> and so now we got to we got to build over that hurdle. So Arthur Brooks talks about the challenge uh, that people go through when they retire. Um, it just I think is applicable here, where they go from doing to teaching, and they find those mm -hmm. are the people that have the most life um, success. So people who do and then never go to teaching, they notice this huge drop off. But the people who do and then as they get older, they they start to teach. They find a similar purpose and meaning, uh, you know, behind it. But here's what I want to do because you have an exercise science background. You obviously know what you're talking about. I want to send you Maps Prime because I think that's something that'll be interesting for you to look at. I'd love your feedback on it. Um, and then if you wanted something else, I think Prime Pro um, and Performance would be two that might be valuable for someone like you. I would but, also uh, consider Symmetry for its isometric component yeah. too. That's a good, good point. I can't remember. I, I bought a couple programs off of you guys before, but I can't remember the one mobility one. That I really like that one that okay. you guys had Probably out. Pro. I can't remember. Pro. Prime Pro or Performance, yeah, one or the other. Like that. but we'll okay. send we'll send you yeah, one yeah. of those and uh, and yeah, I'd love your feedback. But I appreciate you calling in. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate you guys. You, you guys it, are man. doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Keep crushing it. Yeah, that was uh, that's kind of it's like uh, all of us are going it's through home that now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it, it, you do. I mean, you stick to this long enough. I mean, you're gonna have to learn a lot of lessons about acceptance and you know what you know your relationship with exercise and your yeah. body and fitness. Because you get older, things change, your life changes, and you can't just keep applying it the same way. And maybe your ego used to work before, now it ain't going to work now, and just get to learn. Well, the, the silver lining is you're never going to be completely balanced, which <laughs> means you, there's always something to learn yeah, and to true. focus on that's different. You just have to do <coughs> a good... You have to be uh, very aware of like, okay, I I know I, I hate doing this, but I'm willing to get out of my comfort zone to now go in that direction. The, and the hardest hard. the hardest part about this is dissolving the ego because yeah. we we all tend to do this where we get in camps and we identify as a and you got to let go of that. Yeah, you know how hard that is. It's very hard. That's and that to me is the the hardest part of that. I mean, with his background and knowledge and stuff like that, like. You know, doing all suspension trainer, all body weight or all mobility guy. He, I'm sure he has the ability to do that. It's less about can he and it's more like, will you? Will yeah. you put yourself in that position when you've become the bodybuilder strong guy and you've identified with looking away or being strong a certain way? And now you're going to throw all that the window and now become this like super movement guy and mobility guy. And maybe that was people that you made fun of yeah. before. And I so that's, that's a really tough place to go and but it's an unbelievably rewarding when when you when you push yourself in that direction you know in the spirit of challenging yourself and growing i think all of us should sign up for a marathon that's what i think <laughs> that'll really <laughs> pass yeah, i'm gonna tell you guys i'm into jazzercise now so, uh, <laughs> i'd rather do that, that going i'd rather do jazzercise <laughs> than a marathon we're in leotards our next caller is peter from maine peter what's happening how can we help you so um, I'm training right now to, for a professional soccer tryout that starts in December 11th, 10th and 11th. And so I'm 24 years old, playing soccer pretty much all my life. Um, I just finished your MAPS anabolic, re went really well, but I heard about the tryout and I was like, okay, I think I'm going to start transitioning, focus more on soccer. And I have your MAPS 15 program, and I was debating on either starting that or doing MAPS performance. I wasn't sure because of my busy schedule, because I work Monday through Thursday, 8 to 4. And I also want to be able to um, keep up with my soccer throughout the this month as I also lift and stuff, but I don't, my main focus is necessary to get bigger is just kind of maintain so more most of my focus is on the soccer um, aspect of it this time but i guess my question is should i do performance 
or should I do map 15? Because I know there'd be three sessions throughout the day, Monday through Friday or Sunday. And then for mass performances, three days a week. So I wasn't exactly sure. Well, wow. you know That's why question? Yeah. You mm -hmm. know why I like this question? Because you're a high level athlete, obviously you're trying out for a professional soccer team. And when you work with an athlete of your level, a coach or trainer, the first thing they look at is I don't want to do anything that'll mess this up. Okay. So what I mean by that is you're already performing at a very high level. And, uh, the bigger risk is that I have you do a workout program that actually does something that actually takes away from your performance because you're already so finely tuned at your specific sport. Yeah. I honestly think mass 15 would be appropriate. Be great. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. That, Agreed. That would be it. It's a great Agreed. idea. Agreed. I wouldn't add anything else to that. That's right. Mostly yeah. play soccer. And yeah. then maps 15 is enough touching the weights that it'll, it'll the right amount of stress. Is, and you said you have a busy, busy schedule and everything else. And it'll complement it. Well, won't add too much to what you're already doing with soccer. Yeah. So I think it's perfect. And by the way, we, we wrote that in a way. So it's a six day a week program, but we wrote it in a way that you could also like push the two days together like monday and tuesday could go together so if you find there's oh, days yeah. where you're going to play more soccer and a day like maybe you're off like i might go i might combine two of the days on my off day and then take the day off of weight training on my soccer day so you could also kind of play with it like that yeah. so it's written in a way that you could make them into you know a longer 30 to 40 minute workout or you can make it in the the six short 15 I, minutes and i would i honestly like the short workouts yeah. i like the daily short workouts better i think that the longer workout might be a little it, it, honestly i think it would might not be as effective for you and if when you do do the workouts do them after your so if you do play soccer that day do it after soccer yeah. later in the day or whatever not before the only thing i would say is like if you're gonna be able to pull and extract a bit from the mass performance would be the mobility day that's like it, maybe yeah. take one of those like per week just to kind of like go through the joint integrity and make sure everything's moving and connected um but other than that like just running the mass 15 is going to do a do lot. you do you peter do you have a performance already yeah, he said he had uh, no. Right? No, he didn't say he had oh, it. He said he was bad. thinking about doing it. I'll have Doug send that to you. Okay. And, and you do have MAPS 15, okay. right? Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. So, so Doug's going to send you performance. And the only thing I would add would be like, um, if you want more stuff, like um, uh, Prime Pro, Prime. Or Symmetry Post Soccer. And then Symmetry Post Soccer, where you're not when you're not in season. Mm -hmm. But yeah, really, the big thing for you is, Peter, don't... There's a big mistake that young athletes at your level make is they think, okay, they now I'm going to go to the it. next level. Mm -hmm. I got to add a bunch of more, st bunch more stuff to what I'm doing, and you. What'll end up happening is you, you might actually reduce your performance. So really, like what you've done has already got you to this point. So you don't want to add too much more. You add a little bit, and just be more consistent, and that's about it. Adding a ton more, it's like you know what's been working for you has been working. So you don't want to go crazy with that. And it's different now. If I was talking to like a high school athlete, they just started playing sport. It'll be a totally different conversation. But at your level, like I said, it's like we don't want to mess anything up. That's the biggest risk. Yeah. And so going back to what you were saying before, so you were saying, so because right now, because of the three sessions a day and I wanted to do soccer first, should I just do like a 30 minute session of soccer in the morning and then do my training lifting after? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. You got it. After All we right. hang up with you, you're going to hear Sal and I argue about this a little bit too. So you can you can definitely make sure you listen to that because I don't know if I fully agree on the every day necessarily. Because if you have days off of soccer, I personally would uh, rather see you do a little bit. Longer. I could see either way. I, I really could yeah. see either way. But. Yeah. So I I would go by how you feel. So I would take both of our advice on that. Like he's saying, 15 minutes every day for or the six days a week. I'm saying, hey, if you have some down days of soccer or the days you maybe take off, I would go a little bit longer on the workouts and combine them, and then and then take, take a day off, off. Take, take time off mm -hmm. on some of the soccer days. So I, I I try both, try both and see how which one, how your and what matters most is performance in soccer here. I care less about. Yeah. you know how strong or muscle you feel and all that shit yeah. like right now it's like you're, you're trying to get at the professional level right now so to me if i'm your coach i'm like hey how was how was practice this week the way we trained like did you feel better on the field did you feel worse on the field yeah. and then i would let that uh steer me in the direction of how yeah. i actually and then email us let us know if you made the team or not okay i yeah, definitely yeah. will that way we can take the credit sure. you got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks peter yeah. yes thank you so much guys have a you great day uh, okay so so you know why I said 15 every, I would have, had you asked me that question a year ago, I would have said what you said. The reason why I said every day is when we had Schlesinger, yes, Schlesinger on the show say. and he talked about, you know, what, what's one thing you would have changed with your college training and what's he doing now? And he talks about these micro, Frequency. 
micro sessions and just frequent training of very short, like one or two lifts. That's why I went the 15 minute every day. Well, to that he, point, he changed, he and really then ramping it up. Okay, so, so to that to point, that, later. that would be fun. For, so if uh, Peter, if you're listening to this, make sure you do go back and listen to that episode with Corey Schlesinger because that was such a good episode. Based off of that then, and because he's doing three micro soccer sessions a day too, right? It wouldn't be bad for him to do soccer and then do one exercise after that. Mm -hmm. Do soccer, then another, one, exercise. another exercise. If possible. Yeah, if yeah. possible. If he's got access. I like that. Um, that based off of that information from Corey, and, and to your point, then it wouldn't be bad to actually look at the week of all the exercises we have and actually go like this. If I'm doing three micro soccer sessions a day, then I'm just going to do like one movement after it. I'm going to train mm -hmm. my soccer for 30 minutes. Especially or, with the suspension trainer. Uh -huh. You can hook that up right there on the field. Uh -huh. Yeah. He blew my mind with that where it was like the opposite of what I would lead them in, in, in terms of peaking them and then sort of like tailing it back off like in season versus yeah. he kind of like ramps them up towards the end of the season. Yeah. But really it makes a lot of sense when you really yeah. think about yeah. it. I, I think another point I want to hammer home is at this level, because if you're like a fitness person or a trainer and you're listening to us and you're like, what are you talking about? 15 minutes a day. He's a high level athlete or whatever. I'm telling you right now, the biggest mistake <laughs> trainers and coaches make with high level athletes is they mess them up. Yeah, totally. They mess them up. Like that's the, like, and it's so easy to mess someone up performing at this high of a level. Like if I snap my fingers and added five pounds of muscle on his frame, his performance would decline because mm -hmm. he doesn't have the, the same coordination and skill with that bigger body. For example, you ask the average person, they'd say, oh, that would help him. Not really. So really what you do when you look at someone like that, is you say, all right, what can I do? That's not going to mess him up. Let's start there. And then we'll look at, you know, how to improve their performance. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets. At the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out. And less injury. That's another mm -hmm. thing. You'll see less injury as well.